Good morning, River Church. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. It is great to be with you this morning. My name is Daniela, and I just have a few announcements before we carry on with today's service. If this is your first time, welcome. We are so glad that you came this morning and that you decided to join us. We are so happy that you're here. Um, I have an announcement that's just for you. When you walked in, you should have received a connection card. Looks like this card right here. If you didn't, we do have them um, on the table in the back. But we would love for you to fill this out and give us a little bit of information about you and have a way to follow up with you after you leave. Um, but if you will s fill this out, hold on to it, and then after the service ends, if you will go to the welcome table over there in the back, um, Pastor Randy and his wife Lydia would love to personally meet you and welcome you to the church, and they have a special gift for you. So fill out your connection card, hold on to it, and then take it to that table after the service ends. For everyone else, feel free to fill out the card, um, give us your prayer requests, any needs that you may have. The leaders of this church would love to know how to specifically pray for you, so if you want to do that on your connection card, fill it out and then drop it in the offering containers as they go by later on. A um, Couple of important announcements. This week is gonna look a little bit different than how the past couple weeks have been looking. Um, we are taking a break from our regularly scheduled programming of Tuesday night prayer gathering and Wednesday night community night. We are doing that because we are prepping a lot of things for the holidays. And so we're so excited for that time of year just on its way. Um, and so this week, this Tuesday, and this Wednesday, we will be taking a break from those two things. Um, but we have something super fun coming up, which is our annual River Church Thanksgiving potluck dinner. Um, ever since this church was started, this is a tradition that has happened every year. The only year it didn't happen was last year because of the pandemic. But that makes this one, I think, even more special that we get to gather as a church together and share this Thanksgiving potluck meal. I hope that every one of you will join us. If this is your first time, you will please come join us as well. Um, and we would love to, to gather together as a church and have this dinner together. Um, a little logistical thing on that. If you didn't know, the word potluck means like everyone brings something. So we would love for you out of the goodness of your heart to contribute something on that night. Um, and we just want to have a big table full of all of your goods. Um, whether you have this like old recipe that you love and you can't wait to share it with everybody, or you just got to pick up something on your way over here, that's okay too. Um, but we would love to just come together, everyone bring something and share that meal um, as a church. And so if you will find these clipboards um, over on the welcome table, we've got five of them because I know that you guys are just gonna rush over there and sign up to bring something. So we've got a handful of them. Go back there and you can put your name and what you wanna bring um, and we'll just kind of get an idea of all the, the good stuff that you guys will bring on that night. So it's next Tuesday at seven. Um, that's all I have for today. Randy is going, Pastor Randy is going to lead us um, as we close out. Well, you guys know that I'm a sucker for the holidays. Uh, if you don't know, Channel 71 on Satellite Radio, that's, that's the holiday channel. Anytime my children aren't in the car, that's, that's what I'm listening to. Um, I'm looking forward to the Thanksgiving potluck dinner. It is one of the, my favorite events. It, it rivals uh, our, our Christmas Eve service uh, for me and my heart, just, just that, that warm, fuzzy feeling that I get. So I am looking forward to this. As Daniela said, because we missed it last year, it's even that much more special. Uh, here, here's, a, here's a request that I have. If it, one of you, doesn't have to be many of you, doesn't even have to, you have to be a few, just one of you. If somebody would make something with rhubarb in it, I, I, it, will, it will bring a smile to my face. If you don't know what rhubarb is, don't even worry about it. But some of you know what rhubarb is, and if... If some of you, one of you, whatever, could make something with rhubarb in it, it will bring a smile to Pastor Randy's face. Uh, listen, as you know, I've been out of the pulpit now. I'm not preaching today. Pastor Billy is for, for four weeks. And I just want to say thank you to, to, to Pastor Billy for covering for me uh, as, I, as I just took a little break from the, from the pulpit. And, and last week, uh, 
uh, Pastor Marco De Leon from, from the storehouse, our, our sister 829 Church up in McAllen, he preached. Uh, but, but especially you, Billy, thank you for serving us and for serving me well. Lydia and I were talking about it a few weeks ago, and I said, when is the last time I haven't preached four weeks in a row? And it's been like 15 years probably since I've done that. So it was good. It was good. And that, so that, that predates... That predates River Church, obviously. So um, having said that, I will be back in the pulpit next week. I know you guys just can't wait. It's going to be a two-hour service because I got, I got a lot to say. No. With that, let me bring Pastor Billy up. I'm going to pray for him, and we will, we will continue. Let me just, yeah. Let's take it. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Sunday's and how you have designed us, your children, to gather together. You have called us to not forsake gathering together, but you have rather called us to want to gather together, to, to find that you've designed us such that we, we thrive in community. In isolation, all by ourselves, we tend to not do so well, but but in community, we thrive. So we thank you for your perfect design of the church, the body of Christ, and how it not only glorifies you, but it, 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 it serves us so well. God, I pray for Pastor Billy today as he, as he brings the word. I pray that you would, you, would, um, you would take what's on these pages in front of him and you would just bring it to life. I pray that what... He says that is from you would take root in our hearts and it would grow. And I pray that anything else that he says would just fall by the wayside and we would, we would really um, capture the essence of what you have for us today. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. You're, you're welcome. Of course you're welcome. You go where you, where you please, but you're welcome in the sense that we want to be aware of your presence, Holy Spirit. We, want, we don't want to miss it. So pray that you'd speak um, prophetically through Pastor Billy. I know he's prepared hard. He's got, he's got prepared words to say. But pray that you'd, in addition to that, give him, give him additional words that maybe he didn't, even, he didn't even prepare. Words from you. Speak boldly through him and, 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 and change our hearts in the process. We pray this in Christ's strong and mighty name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How's everybody doing? I hope you guys are doing good. Um, this week I was prepping for this sermon, and uh, uh, it, was, it was during the evening. I was prepping for the sermon. I was getting everything ready, trying to get organized, get my thoughts in order, and um, <clears throat> it was about, I don't know, 7.30, and my, my kids uh, came up to me and they're like, hey, Daddy, can you, uh, can you watch a movie with us? And uh, I was like, all right, guys. Um, and so usually what happens is, is uh, when I'm working, I want to work. But when I'm at home with my family, I really want to spend time. I want to be there with my family. And so this was the time, the pocket of time that my family was around. My kids were, were playing, so I wanted to spend time with them. So I took a break, and we went to go watch The Emperor's New Groove. Um, it's a cool movie. I think that's what it's called. I don't know. Um, it's where the guy turns into a camel. Um, <clears throat> And then he turns back, not into a camel. Llama. You're right. Llama. I wasn't paying attention. I got there after that, right? Um, and so, so they, 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 we, we finished the movie. It's a good movie. It's a funny movie. And uh, afterwards, it's done. It's about 8 o'clock. And so I go back to the table to work on my sermon. And, and my kids, my 5-year-old son, William, and my 3-year-old son, Matthew, they come to me and they're like, you know, still not their bedtime yet, and I'm still feeling guilty that I'm not with them. And they come up to me and like, Daddy, can we play with you? Or can you play with us? I'm like, oh, man, I can't right now, guys. I'm sorry. I love you. I can't play with you guys. Uh, I'm working on my sermon, and, and my oldest son, William, says, well, can we help you with your sermon? <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, I was like, sure, son. Um, I don't know how this is going to work out, but we'll... we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll um, We'll try and figure it out. And so one of the questions I asked him as I said, William, <clears throat> or I told my boys, I said, 
Uh, hey, hey, boys, William Matthew, what do you guys, what do you guys l- like about money? What do you guys think about money, right? And William says, well, I like money. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, like, I like money, Daddy. And I said, okay, so well, why do you like money? And he said, well, because I get to buy all the Legos I want to buy. And I was like, okay, my son loves Legos. Uh, and so I was like, man, this is going to be, it's only going to get more expensive, right? Legos, you can get away with getting them the $5 ones now, but man, those things are expensive. Anyway, that's besides the point. Um, and so then I asked my son, my other son, Matthew, I'm like, Matthew, do you like money? Or what do you like about money? He's like, I don't like money, Daddy. I was like, thank you, Lord. Don't have to worry about, don't have to worry about this. But <clears throat> it was such a blessing that that conversation really did help me with the sermon and and. And as I started to think about their answers, uh, I started uh, to see that, that uh, I started to think theologically about their answers, about their interest in money, about their desire in money, especially Williams. Um, and I, I, I started to think, man, why, why do we as, as people like money? Why are we attracted to money? What is it about money that people like? And I would say that there is a sense of security in money. There is a sense of validation in money. There's a sense of if I put in the work, then you will see it because of the money I have or the possessions that come with the work that I do. And so there's one thing, though, that that money can't do for us, uh, and that's earn us salvation, right? We can't be saved because of the money we have or the possessions we have. <clears throat> and so today we're going to talk about what can save us. And so at River Church over the past, I don't know, since September, uh, we've been talking about going through this Home is Here series. And in this Home is Here series, our hope is that you guys can find a home at River Church. The people who don't go to church can find and make River Church their home. We want people to have to find a home here. That's, that's what we want. But that's not the ultimate thing that, that me and Pastor Randy desire, right? Uh, the, the ultimate thing that me and Pastor Randy desire is not that you make River Church your home, although we absolutely want you to do that, the main thing that we want you guys, we want to see, is we want to see you guys <clears throat> find life in Jesus. We want you guys to, to find a home in Jesus. We want you to find community in Jesus. And so that's what this whole Home is Here series is about. Now, with that, right, with becoming a Christian, with becoming a Christ follower, usually begs the question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And that's the title uh, of our sermon this morning, What Must I Do to Be Saved? It's a question that we all have. It's a question that I've had. Um, So we're going to talk about it this morning. We're going to talk about it this morning. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the story of the rich young ruler found in Matthew or the rich young man found uh, in Matthew. And so it's really interesting in this section of Scripture, uh, it's the, the, the Scriptures in Matthew 19, uh, but in those f- uh, surrounding chapters, right, Jesus is, is talking to uh, his disciples about what it means <clears throat> to live in community with Jesus. Right? It's about his kingdom community. And the previous chapters leading up to this, it's the, the famous story of Jesus leaving the 99 sheep to go find the one that has gone astray. Right? Uh, there's this idea that as someone is leaving the community, right, leaving the flock, Jesus is going to go and get that person and bring that person back into the community. On Wednesday night, we talked about... Um, Uh, We talked about bringing people uh, who have sinned against us. We talked about resolving conflict in in community. And so when someone sins against us, we talked about how to resolve that. And the idea there was 
as someone sins against us uh, and they are on the verge of <clears throat> uh, exiting the church or, or being removed from the church, uh, our hope as Christians is to prevent that from happening. We want to do all that we can to keep them from leaving. We want, we want the, the body of Christ to remain intact. <coughs> And so in our passage today with the rich young ruler, it's not so much on someone who is who's part of the community and who's, who is exiting the community we're trying to keep in, but it's how do I even get into the community? How can I be saved? What must I do to be saved? So we're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. Uh, it is of the rich young man. It says, verse 16, it says, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, the rich young man said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And <clears throat> you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, <coughs> Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and have followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. So again, we're answering the question, what must I do to be saved? And to answer this question, we're going to follow, we're going to trace the dialogue that's happening uh, in this passage, right? And, and we'll get to that in just a sec, but I want to explain a little bit about the rich young man. Now this person, what we can observe, this person is rich, and this person is young, right? Uh, some translations also say, describe him as the rich, young ruler. So rich, young, and a ruler, right? Some people believe that maybe he was also a religious leader because of his strict adherence to the law, right? He obeyed the commandments, uh, everything that was in the law. Uh, he did those things. And so because of that, people think that he was a religious leader. It's interesting, though, because although he kept the commandments, he still didn't feel right. <clears throat> the first thing I want us to look at is this, and it's our question. What must I do to be saved? When I was younger, I thought that uh, being a Christian was being a rule keeper. If I just follow the rules, I'm good, right? I, I, I started to, uh, because of that, I, I, I stopped, uh, I, I didn't say bad words, right? I uh, didn't drink, 
I you know, was nice to people. I was doing all of these things that uh, I thought the Bible taught because that's what I thought I needed to do to be saved. I was a rule keeper. The rich young ruler was the same way. And maybe some of us sitting in this room are the same way as well. We, we think that being a Christian, we think that what must I do to be saved? It's about keeping and obeying the rules, right? Obeying the commandments. It's exactly uh, what the rich young ruler was thinking. <clears throat> he was a rule keeper. So, so he first asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And then the conversation continues, right? He asks, he asks Jesus, what good deed must I do to enter eternal life? And Jesus says to keep all the commandments. What does he say? He says, I've done all those things, right? Uh, do not commit adultery, do not cheat, do not steal, don't lie, right? Jesus is referencing the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament, right? He's referencing the law in the Old Testament, and, G and the rich young man is saying, I have done all of those things. You know, being a Christian uh, at work, so this is my first year, or my first few months working here, uh, but before I was working here, I was a high school coach uh, at, at uh, one of the high schools here, and I was the Christian guy at, at work, right? Oh, Billy's the, the Christian. They, yeah. Um, and so I was a Christian guy. And so a lot of my coworkers, a lot of the other coaches would come to me and they would say, okay, Billy. <clears throat> and they would ask me these like ridiculous questions. Like I'm not even going to say what the questions were. But they would say, uh, they would ask me these ridiculous questions. Hey, can, does the Bible say that I can do this? Or does the Bible allow me to do this specific thing? Like what can and can I not get away with? <clears throat> and maybe you guys in your work environment have experienced a lot of those same questions. But as I, as I, and I really appreciate the questions because they got me thinking theologically on these different topics, but what I came to realize is at the heart of this, these questions, right, can I do this, can I not do that, at the heart of this question, these questions was, what must I do to be saved? What must I do so the Lord isn't mad at me? Again, maybe, maybe that's some of us here, right? Maybe we have try, uh, tried to keep the rules. We have tried to do all that we can so the Lord just doesn't wipe us off the face of the earth, so, so the Lord doesn't hate us. And so we try and do all of our good deeds, and, and we start to measure our good deeds versus our, our bad deeds, and, 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 we, and, we, and we play this game of, of how much good have I done versus how much bad have I done. <clears throat> the problem with that, and I've struggled with this too, is there, there are, is, is this, is, it's our works don't save us. The things that I do don't save us. There are many, many nice people that I know who stand in opposition to God. There's many people who hold the door for people, who are kind to people, who tell the truth. But, but, but they stand in opposition to God. It's not our works that make us right before God. So, so let's get back to the conversation it says, <clears throat> what good deeds must I do to inherit eternal life? Right? The rich young man said this. Jesus said, keep all the commandments. The rich young ruler says that I have done all these things. And this next thing that the rich young man says is important. He says, you know, I've done all those things, but what am I, what am I missing? What am I lacking? I've, I, I've, I've kept the law my whole life, but something isn't right. What is not right? You see, he was keeping the law. He was doing what the Old Testament commanded, but he felt like it wasn't enough. Again, as I was 
uh, a rule keeper when I was younger, the same thought process would go through my mind. I'm doing all these things, but man, this bad stuff that I'm doing, that's, man, that's really bad, right? This, my, my, my metric system, my, the way I, I judge this is, is incorrect. I'm missing something, and that's what the rich young man says. He says, what do I still lack? And the next words out of Jesus' mouth, they expose the man's heart. Jesus says to him, he says, so the rich young man says, um, what am I missing? What do I lack? And Jesus tells him, sell everything, give to the poor, and follow me. Right? We must surrender everything. We must give to the poor. We must follow Jesus. Now, as you read this, as you look at this, you may be thinking already, well, that's just another thing for me to do, right? If I just sell everything, if I give all my stuff away and follow Jesus, I'm good. And that's, that's not what Jesus is saying here, but Jesus is exposing the man's heart, right? He is, he is uncovering the sin in his heart. <clears throat> if you look closely at what he says, right, he says, Uh, Jesus calls him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me, right? What is he doing in this passage? We talk about this almost every week, right? He's he's calling calling uh, the rich young ruler to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself, right? He's calling him to this. He's saying, you've been keeping the law, but you have not loved the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you do not love your neighbor as yourself, and let me prove it to you. So what happens as a result of this? All right, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that here uh, in just a second. But what I want to highlight is Jesus um, uncovers his heart. He shows his heart. He peels the layers back. And you see that this person was not doing these things. He did not truly love the Lord. He truly loved himself. If he would have loved God, then he would have done what God had called him to do. <coughs> but he, he wasn't loving God, and he wasn't loving his neighbor. And the Bible, man, the Bible is full of these stories, guys. I, I, was, I mean, it's all over the place. I could give countless examples. I mean, every failure in the Bible is a result of this concept, of this, the, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord, love your neighbors. Right? I was reading the story of Cain and Abel. I just got a new Bible. It's a reader's Bible, so it doesn't have all the verses in it. I mean, the scriptures are there, but the verse numbers are not there. Um, it's not like a blank page where I'm just writing. That's not... And so uh, the verse numbers are not there. So anyway, I was going through uh, the story of Cain and Abel, and man, the same thing, right? Cain doesn't give God his, his best offering, right? He just gives him the minimum, and then he gets jealous at his brother, right? He did not love God, did not love his neighbor. We see that happening here. So at this point, at this point, you might be thinking, okay, so we still have not answered our question, Billy. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, he, Jesus says, and again, this is not answering the question, but Jesus exposes his heart, right? And, 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 and he says you must love the Lord and you must love your neighbor. He's, he's pointing to the answer, but that's not the answer. Okay, if we remember, uh, what does, uh, when they approach Jesus and they say, Jesus, what are the two greatest commandments? Or what's the greatest commandment? Which of these should I keep? And Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But the interesting thing about this, as we've seen, is we cannot do that correctly, right? Those two phrases, love the Lord, love your neighbor as yourself, those are a representation, a summary of the whole Old Testament law, right? The whole law could not save us, right? The Old Testament 
could not save us, right? In fact, the Old Testament, all the laws uh, that, 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 that God gave to, to Moses, right, that, that are in the, all the Old Testament laws, 600 laws, all of those things tell us how much we cannot save ourselves. So all of these Old Testament laws, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, love your neighbor as yourself, are things that we cannot do. And as we try to do those things, we realize how bad we are at actually trying to do those things. And they point us to our Savior. They point us to Jesus, right? I can't do it, but they point us forward. Now, before we get too far down that road, I want to talk a little bit about what Jesus says in response to this, right? <clears throat> what must I do to be saved? Okay, uh, and then the person uh, uh, walks away, the rich young ruler walks away, right? He's sad because uh, he had many possessions. And so right after this, Jesus says uh, to his disciples, he says, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person Enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I want to pause here. I want to say something. Uh, I want to clarify something. God does not hate rich people, right? God does not hate you if you have money. If you're super rich, you got all the money in the world, God doesn't hates you. God is not opposed to you. You don't have to be poor in order for God to love you. But what he does say is it's hard for the rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, now why does he say this? Why is it hard for the rich people? Uh, why does Jesus say that it's hard for the rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, I'm not rich. Um, but <clears throat> what I've observed is, is people who have money, uh, they usually uh, get money because they work hard, right? Money, excuse me, money usually comes with work, right? The people who put in the time, the people who put in the effort will get, have the money, will have the possessions. There's this, 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 this phrase I've been seeing online. It says, if you want to shop without looking at the price tag, you need to work without looking at the clock. Right? There's this idea that, that money, I mean, work equals money. I know a guy who is relatively rich, and um, man, this dude, he, would, he was working all the time. Like, he would come to work like before anybody got there. He was up before the sun was out. Right? He, he was working all day, you know, uh, we finished our job, and then he would go to a second job and, and do more work there, and he would get home, and it was already dark again. This, this guy was working all the time. And you could see it, right? He had nice things. He had nice clothes. He had nice uh, vehicles. He had nice things, but, but he put in a lot of work, and he was able to to, to accumulate money as a result of this. Right? You see this with some of the richest people in the world. You look at uh, Jeff Bezos, and it's like every super, super, super rich person is like this. <clears throat> but their lives are, it, it, it's like clockwork. Like they wake up and, and it's all, item, uh, it's all uh, lined up. They have an itinerary for their day. There's like no dead time. They just can't stop working. 16, 17, 18 hour days. They go to sleep, they wake up, and they do it again. Right? They do that all of the time. Now, why is it hard for the rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven? It's because the temptation is to rely on the work that I've done. Right? The temptation is, man, I've built all this for myself. Surely I can, I can handle life's problems. I have the resources to do this. I have the resources to take care of myself. And, and, and they tend to become more dependent on their own works than on Jesus' work. Now, <clears throat> It's, it's not just rich people, and we'll see that in this next, next comment, right? And so, so Jesus says it's really hard for the rich person to enter the kingdom of God, and the disciples say, 
well, if that guy can't make it, then who can make it? Right? All of us struggle, like the rich person, with the temptation to put our hope, to put our faith into something else. And the disciples are like, man, this guy's got it all together. He's rich, he's young, he's probably a religious leader, right? He's, he, he's got everything going for him. If he can't make it, what hope do I have? Who can be saved? As, as, they, as, they, <clears throat> as they look at uh, this person, who uh, can, as he looks at, uh, uh, as the disciples look at the rich young ruler, they, it says they are astonished, right? They were, they were surprised, right? Because in the Old Testament, uh, uh, oftentimes uh, when people were prosperous, it's because the Lord, uh, they found favor in the sight of the Lord. And so this guy was young, he was rich, and it looked like he had everything going for him. And Jesus saying, man, it's all so hard for that guy. And the disciples say, well, if he can't make it, who can be saved? And in verse 26, we see our answer. It says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is, uh, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. With man, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Right. You cannot save yourself. Your works cannot save you. The things that you do, the, the rules that you keep cannot save you. But Jesus can. Right, as Jesus is pointing back to the Old Testament law, he's saying, look, your works, they can't save you. I can. Come follow me. Come with me. I can save you. Our works cannot save us. Our works, our failures, expose our hearts, expose our need for a Savior. <clears throat> Now, with this verse, we tend to take this verse, right, with God, all things are possible. You know, like, man, I didn't study all night last night. I got a test in the morning. Oh, you know, with God, all things are possible. I'm not saying they're not, absolutely. But that's not what this verse is talking about right here. All right, it's not so my basketball team can win, right? We're play, facing, you know, San Antonio this week. It's, that's not what this is about, okay? This is about salvation. You can't save yourselves. I can't save myself. But with God... We can be saved. Right? With, with God, it is possible to have life. Right? You go from, a, uh, you go from death to life. You, going, uh, you go from being a stranger to God, in opposition to God, to a child of God. You can't do it, but with God, it is possible. And at the end of this passage, Jesus kind of widens the scope a little bit. He says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So he talks about a house, your siblings, your family, your kids, your land. Or if you deny, if you don't rely on these things for salvation, to, to prove your worth, to prove your identity, if you give these things up for me, then you'll have eternal life. So does that, does that mean that God is calling us to sell our houses or, you know, run from our family or get rid of our kids? <laughs> William, sorry, bud, we're not going to, not making it home today. Matthew, it's been fun, man. That's not what he's calling us to necessarily, but what he's saying is our identity, is our, is our worth, is who we are, should not, should not be tied to our stuff, should not be tied to our money, it should not be tied to the things around us. <clears throat> and if we're not careful like the rich young man, if we're not careful, then we too can rely on other things for our salvation as opposed to Jesus. 
Now, you might be sitting there and saying, you know, Billy, I don't have much, right? I've already given everything away. And that's what Peter actually does in this passage. He's like, Lord, we've already given away our houses. We've already done all of these things. All right? I'm, I'm not like the rich person. I, I've already given all this stuff. And I say, not so fast, guys. Not so fast. It's not about what you have or what you don't have. It's not about what you've done or what you've given up, what you've submitted. It's, about, it's not about your work. It's about Jesus' work. It's about what he has done. Now, guys, there's, there's a lot of things that, that hold us. There's a lot of things that, that, that we replace as Lord in our life. There's a lot of things that we rely on to save us that is not Jesus. And you're thinking, man, there's no way that I could give up doing that thing. There's no way that I could give up you know, getting drunk every evening. There's no way that I could give up being mean to my spouse or, or uh, working, putting too many hours in at work. There's no way I could do that. And I would say, you're right. And I, and I want to give you like five steps to do this and your money will be better or do this and you can have, have a, 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 better, a better relationship with your spouse. And all those things are good, but at the heart of it, guys, is we can't do those things without the Lord working in our hearts. We cannot turn from sin without the Lord working in our hearts. It's how, so how do we become saved? It's not our work. It's Jesus' work. It's not about our sacrifice. It's about Jesus' sacrifice. <clears throat> On the way over here, uh, we... Uh, we um, on the, so on Sunday mornings before we come to church, I usually take my kids out to, to breakfast, right? And uh, we'll go to McDonald's or we'll go wherever we go. And, and usually we get down, we go inside, and we sit at, they have like a little like electronic game table. And we sit there, and the boys love it. Uh, but today was just a different day. Couldn't, couldn't afford to stay there. Um, so we uh, got, we got drive through or not drive through but where you park and curbside. Uh, we got curbside, and so... <clears throat> uh, whenever we park, my boys are usually like, hey, Daddy, uh, what can, uh, can, we, can we get them buckled? Right? We're waiting. The guy's going to take a while. Can we get them buckled and, and come up there with you in the front? So I said, sure, guys. And so I unbuckle them. They come, sit on my lap, and Matthew's like rolling down the window and like sticking his head out and rolling his, like, dude, what are you doing, son? Um, but they come up there with me, right? And so today, William did that, and... Uh, uh, William and Matthew did that, and, and, and William decided to sit on my lap, right? He sat on my lap, and he changed the radio station, right? I was listening to, like a good Christian, I was listening to 96.9, uh, and uh, he changed it to 94.5. I was like, you rebel child. Um, that, I didn't say that. Um, but it was, it was funny because 94.5 came on, and this happens, like, all the time. I don't know how or why this happens, but it happens all the time. Uh, and and uh, a Pink Floyd song came on, uh, Money, and I was like, well, there you go. <laughs> I'm, about, I'm about to preach on this. Um, but then the other song that I heard as my boy was sitting up there with me was Leonard Skinner's Free Bird. Yeah, yeah it's a good one. Um, <laughs> And so, man, that song is super good, and so the guitar comes up, and, and it's a guitar solo, and it's going on for long, and I just start tickling my son, pretending to play the guitar. He's having a great time. I should have chosen a shorter song because my hands started to get hurt, and it was just a long time to tickle my son. But the interesting thing about that song is what, is what uh, was, is, are the lyrics just before they get into the guitar solo, and, and the song goes... Lord knows I can't change. <laughs> Lord, help me, I can't change. That, man, that hit it right on the head. Guys, we cannot change by ourselves. Right? We need the Lord's help for deliverance. We need the Lord's help to be saved. All right, so as we ask the question, you know, what must I do uh, to have eternal life? What must I do to be saved? So trust with Jesus, trust in Jesus and his work that he has done for us. With us, it is impossible. 
With God, all things are possible. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the work that you have done for us, Lord. Thank you for doing the work that we could not do, Lord. Lord, I just pray over us this morning. I pray that as we, as we look for other alternatives to, 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 to look for, uh, for validation, Lord, I pray that we just trust in you. We trust in your work, Lord. Throughout this week, Lord, I pray that as, as we get troubled, as we get into these dif- difficult circumstances, as, as, as we want to run from you, Lord, I pray that we trust in you to keep us close. I pray that we trust in you, right? If, if maybe, we, maybe we are not Christians, maybe we've been doing our own thing for a while, Lord, I pray that we just beg you, Lord, help me, I cannot change. Lord, take over my life. I cannot do this. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.